Welcome to OM Report by Andre Alpa, your interview-focused podcast on topics from online marketing to internet startups. Adam, All right. so great to have you. Can you please introduce yourself? It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Audet, and I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer at RKG. And RKG is a digital marketing company. Okay. So, so Chief Knowledge Officer would mean you understand your ways even beyond SEO. Does that, is that true or is that... Well, I'm supposed to. It's just like a cooler title. It's, a, it's kind of a cooler title. I've always um, been a fan of the continuum data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. It's something my dad taught me and that Google sometimes talks about. And I don't think I can ever work professionally in, over in the wisdom part, but I can work in the knowledge part. And I want to like twice the years of experience. Probably you can. <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. I'll be the chief wisdom officer. But um, you know, I want to take data and get information out of it and deliver knowledge strategically to our clients and to our team. Okay. It's, it seems to be like kind of a trademark of yours to be like more on the technical side of SEO. Mm -hmm. So True. I, I think it's the most technical yeah. presentation I've ever seen in the States, yours in it. Cool, that's great to hear. Is that, is that not the case? Uh, Aren't you mostly like positions like that? Yes, I, I am very experienced in technical SEO and the reason is I kind of cut my teeth in SEO and e-commerce, okay. working with companies like Zappos, and you have to be very technical to get stuff done and to understand how to kind of move things and move the needle for those sites. So, okay. um, And I also am really passionate about the technical work. Okay. You know, that, that's, that said, it's just one piece and you need good content and you need links and social and you need all that sure. other stuff too. But what we found is that the great thing about technical SEO is it's very reliable. You know, it sure. may not be the most high impact thing, but it's something that's very dependable that we can typically move the needle you know you on sites. Work. That's right. Yeah. Sometimes hard to argue with technical SEO, especially when you're coming to something that you haven't worked on before. Yeah. And you're like cleaning up the mess and then they ask, yeah. you know, what's the revenue we get out of the cleaning? Mm -hmm. That's kind of hard to state. How do you deal with that? It is hard and especially because a lot of times with SEO, it's not a single kind of magic silver bullet. It's a bunch of stuff that adds up to, you know, performance lift. Um, I like putting projections on work and kind of justifying the work with that, but typically we'll save that for stuff that I know is going to, you know, be an impact of 15 or 20 percent or something like that, and and then look at the URLs that that SEO recommendation or set of recommendations will impact, and then try to calculate an ROI that way. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll jump to something that I still remember from your presentation. You were you were you mentioning uh, pagination, yes, and that you would really love to use the Relnext Prev on yes. that. Yes, and you also said specifically that one wouldn't need on pages, you know, like on the first page, it's clear you you put it in an index, and on pages two, three, four, and so on. Yes, you would not need to put a no index follow in the robots. Right there, that right. Uh, that I didn't understand. Actually, I, I yeah. would have done it differently. So I was wondering, yeah. you know, why. So when RelPrev first came out, and it was a new tool, and it still is relatively new, but when it first came out, we said, oh, Google explained that if you annotate with RelPrev next, that Google can still fire page, say, 10, page 12, page 7, in a search result if it's relevant for the query. And we said, ooh, we don't want that. We really want page 1 to be the ranking candidate always forever, so we're going to no-index follow all the deeper stuff. But what we found in our test is, tests is that with RelNext Prev, that we're not seeing those deeper pages fire. And, and sure, they could, but we're not seeing those surface in search. So I think they're figuring it out anyways? They seem to be doing a really good job of figuring out that series and kind of putting it all together in, into one you know, but if you, family. If you put so. in the Relnext Prev and you yeah. had the no index, would you switch it back to index? I just to put it, just to have the, make sure that the con the two yeah. concepts are not interfering or something like that? They are independent signals, so yes. you know, rel canonical, rel prev next, and no index could all be used together. Um, I, you know what I would do? I would remove it only if the data showed that it would be a good idea to try something new and test something. But if it's working yeah. and no index is on those pages with rel prev, I would leave it if it's working. Another thing I, I, I still remember from your presentation, you see I was, I was awake and listening. Taking notes, huh? All right. I, I don't have mental notes. notes. Mental okay. notes, exactly. <laughs> and I have a lot of those. Um, nice. You were mentioning that at, at one e-commerce shop, you, you were using products that are not available anymore. Yeah. And, and you were trying to index them via like a separate HTML sitemap. That's how I would interpret what I've seen. Probably I didn't get it right. It was like some dead products. And you said yeah. that that didn't work out. Uh, and and you said that basically you had those old products in the index and you would just, on the products, you would suggest what other products would be similar. That's right. So yeah. why did that not work out? What so we thought, was a mistake on it? 
We had all these expiring products that were never going to come back. Let's just keep them up and let's put a nice recommendation en engine on there to say, hey, you may, we don't have this product, but you may be interested in these other products. It seemed like a good idea. It really didn't work. It, it, what, what about it didn't work? It didn't it drive any. Sense. It didn't drive any revenue. Oh, right. And and either it was because well, probably the, the single products weren't ranking at all. You were just mistaking your data. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> no, no. I no, think. No, no one. I think. I think uh, we got our data pretty dialed. Um, <laughs> the uh, it was a case where you know it was just there wasn't enough. There weren't enough expired and gone products hmm. for that strategy to work. I think. I think for that strategy to work, you need to do it at scale, and you need to have tens of thousands of expired out of stock items and you also need really closely related recommendations. But in an e-commerce setup that would usually be like categories or filters that would match similar products, you know. Yeah. You could filter broader and broader if you don't have enough products so you could make up something like that. that yeah, work you, you could and that's where from the same that's brand where you, your conversion thing. hurts because it as you as you start to widen that and you you put more and more products on there you start to lose that relevance because they were, they were looking for one green widget and now you're saying oh but we also have these yellow boxes you know what i'm saying it, sure. you start to lose that relevance and that's where it hurts so you think so. that the, the average quality perception of your website may be becoming worse because of those dead yeah. products we had low conversions on those pages and they didn't drive revenue i still think that's a valid approach did you take them out of the index no they're After still that? they're still they're still out there but there there's no resources put to them so they're just kind of they're dead products that are dying but are they like growing because there's like i uh, no, they're not stuff? being updated the okay, feed okay. is you is, just did like once yeah. like a bump and then yeah we built a continuous i think system. we we did it for about six months and did you know maybe over 20,000 products were probably on there and that's about as big as it got. Okay. You mentioned you did Zappos and I remember I, I've seen somebody somewhere else who said he did like Zappos for nearly 10 years. That wasn't you though. It was probably me. I started at Zappos no, no, no. Um, in 2001 no, he as did a something consultant. something really, really spammy. It must be something different. There was like this product comparison thing that was like... Oh, the product showdown or yes. the smackdown. That's... Um, That's rather spammy. It's genius. That's Aaron Shear, who's my good friend and worked with me oh, at Zappos for a I'm few sorry, years. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. say spammy. No, it's... Um, it, you, well, genius. You could call it, you could call it uh, aggressive. You know, it's aggressive. Agree. Agree, okay. Basically, what the product showdown was, he would take, um, this is a, a really interesting idea, he would take two products that weren't related at all, yes. and he would, he would surface that product, the image and the description of it, and the user uh, reviews there. He'd put it versus this other product, and then, and then just generate those, and it was a game, and you could choose one that you wanted to win the battle, and then those links. In, it's like you know, hot to or not, but with products. Exactly. I, I would describe it like that's right. in a really, really short way. That's right, yeah. So a really interesting idea to leverage this. So the, the idea was Amazon had done some research way back on remember, putting highly unlikely, exactly. unlikely content together to get it to rank better because it's stuff that Google has never seen before in the world of the internet. Um, but you know, this is the kind of idea that Aaron can bring. He's he's a brilliant SEO. You were consulting them, and he was consulting in parallel. Yes, we worked together. I was the SEO manager as a consultant, so I really had an in-house role at Zappos for several okay, okay. years. And okay. and uh, Aaron came in. He has a great depth of experience in e-commerce. He did a lot with Shopping.com back in the day, and he worked at to me back before that so we brought him in as a hired gun okay okay understood so you were also talking about mobile SEO uh, during your presentation and when, when you when you look at the different opportunities I'm uh, uh, three different options that Google tells us are okay yeah and um, what would you say are like the advantages and disadvantages of the different options because yeah. like one that always comes on top of our mind I mean we've just like our agency website we switched it to responsive design because mm -hmm. it's so on vogue and right. we want to do it also because we suggest it to clients and then I figured out okay maybe it sucks for mobile because the the, the HTML file is still huge mm -hmm. and maybe it would be cooler to have like a really slim mobile version and then do the yeah. alternate and canonical thingy. Right. What, what yeah. other you Really know, fast, yeah. You know, I think the thing with responsive is everybody's talking about it. It's the cool thing and Google is, is pushing it pretty hard as, hey, this is our... This is our this is the dominant solution. Our right? dominant solution. Um, and we have these other two, you know. Yeah. <laughs> really, you have three valid choices. Um, responsive, to me, the weakness in it is you've got one set of H HTML. So to your point, you're going to have larger page size for your mobile, but you're also going to have the same content. Basically, it's just going to be re, you know, resorted. 
And a lot of companies, take an insurance company, for example, they probably want a different mobile experience than desktop experience because they, they see those user experiences as, di as different and user behavior as different. So you lose the opportunity to capture somebody on a mobile or a tablet device if you're using responsive in some ways. Um, so is there so like your favorite solution of those three? Or I is there still think, honestly, the M.dot subdomain is a great way to go. It's simple, it's well understood, it's well supported with the switchboard tags. Um, yeah, and you can still get the advantages of a unique experience on mobile and really fast on mobile too. So yeah. The other thing with it, and one of, the, one, of the one of the attendees in our session actually asked this question is, Google says that there's some, at least some of their ranking factors in mobile are going to be mobile specific. So if you're doing responsive and you're, you have the same HTML as desktop, yeah. are you losing opportunity to rank for mobile specific you know, stuff? And all I can say is that with Google pushing responsive as hard as they are, they must have that figured out in some way. You know? yeah. Um, how are your experiences with with uh, route canonical in, uh, the, the, sorry with Ahrefs Lang uh, mm -hmm. uh, using it? Are, do you do you have like robust experience with that? Does it we, have problems? You does know, it interfere with any of the other concepts? To it your doesn't experience? interfere. It's very complicated. When it first came out, we started doing testing with it right away, and this was before they supported putting it in XML. Yeah. And it was a nightmare if you had you had to put all these you know Ahrefs Lang tags on all of your pages. Um, as far as international, it works very well to set up the signals and kind of give give that l that local signal to Google. You can use it along with you know GWT region targeting and you know good subdomain strategy or TLD strategy, whatever you're doing. And it's nice to have another tool. It's not it's not a cure all for international, and there's still a lot of stuff that exactly. happens. There's still a lot of technical hiccups. Some of it related to hreflang and and wrong implementation so a lot of times we'll see it implemented it has with, to but it won't line up correctly and you know so yeah. what do you think if, if, let's say if i have my us website yep and then i i want to have a, a uk subsidiary and i set up the duplicate content over there yep uh, implement the hreflang uh, correctly and then mm -hmm. My UK website will be ranking for the people searching from the UK because it's a it does a search and yes. replace. So instead of the .com, the that's right. code UK or or the the, the corresponding that's subdomain right. would be ranking. Yep. The the this the subdomain uh, sorry the, the the new the 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 local top level domain it will be generating user signals as like click click through rate bounce rate and mm -hmm. so on and so on. Do you think those will be attributed? to the .com or to the UK domain? I think part of what hreflang is supposed to do is sort of like RELPREVNEXT is consolidate those signals so that so that the, you know, in your example, the well, UK, the COUK is inheriting some sort of ranking signal in some way or maybe it's being shared across all of them, um, but it's, it's a signal that is associated with that specific region. And, you know, this is one of the subtleties of this and Part of why I like RealPrev and hreflang is they're both HTML5 an annotations. Google is like, Push to me, HTML5. this signifies where they're going, you know, and, and that there's going to be a lot more of these tools in our future. So I think I would speculate, and it's just speculation, sure. that there's some sort of link equity, anchor text, you know, you said uh, interesting stuff about kind of user data, you know, impressions, CTR, bounce, all that stuff. That's probably associated in some way with hreflang when you use that. Okay. Um. What do you think is like? The, what's the most typical mistake you just stumble over when when you, when you first come to a client? Is there like like a typical three things where you know? Okay, I bet they they haven't that got that. You know, yeah. You know, on the technical side, typically faceted navigation, pagination is still a problem. Um, the sites aren't doing enough to be faster, so we see a lot of opportunity to speed up their sites. Um, there's latency that shouldn't be there. Um, and then on the content side, you know, we still see a lot of, this is especially true in retail, but using merchandising copy and not writing unique copy on product pages, um, having category pages that really have no copy at all. Um, their site search tends to be really bloated, and there's not a there's not so a. So it's also in the index. It's yeah, just, exactly. It's, it's yeah, being indexed. That's correct, right? And and that's something that we often see and companies won't necessarily have a strategy around their site search because they think about it internally they don't think about the way it's getting crawled and indexed and the problems it's causing there so i, I wonder because of the, the types of problems that you deal with are you mostly working for publishing companies or are you working for you know businesses that are transactional as well as publishers so rkg has we have clients across every category but e-commerce is by far and away our specialty so we have you know most of our clients are in e-com um, How it's just kind of there. Is it just because of you guys? Because you're really good at that, or you know, is it because that fits perfectly to do SEO, and that's 
It's because, so RKG acquired my company, Audit Media, a couple of years ago, and Audit Media was known for e-commerce SEO, um, based largely on my experience with Zappos and, and building kind of that, yeah. that there. And then RKG was really focused on direct marketing with retail. And it just happened to be that way. What we found is that, what's interesting is that in the e-commerce space, they tend to be the most sophisticated companies. And so these are the people that are, it's very competitive and there's a lot of money at stake, obviously. And so there's a lot of innovation and there, there's a lot of focus on SEO as a, as a strategy. And now we're trying to go to travel and finance and other areas and, and apply those learnings because in some ways, you know, travel, for instance, lags a bit behind in terms of how quickly they're adopting okay. um, a lot of the kind of cutting edge SEO. and. Uh, so it's interesting, but yes, most, mostly we are known for SEO because we're hardcore direct marketers. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, thanks yeah. a lot for the interview. Thank you. Right. Pleasure. OM Report and Andre Alpa would like to thank you for your attention. You can get more episodes on www.omreport.com.